So what I wanted to do, um, and what I should have done at the beginning, is when talking about refuge, describe the refuge of Israelization. But I didn't. I just jumped in and talked about refuge. So um, the visualization for that, okay, is um, you have, you imagine Amitabha's pure land. Yeah, very beautiful place and waterfalls and meadows and the birds, which are emanations of Amitabha, teaching, giving teachings and so on. And then in the center is a, <clears throat> a precious throne with peacocks. I'm not sure what the peacocks symbolize. Elephant throne is for strength. Lion throne is for, you know, I think the lion's roar. I'm not sure what peacocks. Anybody know? Oh, yeah, I bet. The, yeah. Yeah, standing for the, the bravery of bodhisattvas, the courageous bodhisattvas who uh, dwell in samsara and liberate sentient beings. Okay, on top of the throne, you have a thousand petal lotus and a moon disk, and then on, Amitabha sits on top of that. And his body is ruby red. Okay, his hands are in his lap um, in meditation position. He's also holding an alms bowl, alms bowl that is filled with nectar. Okay, so uh, similar to how we often see the Buddha sitting, although the Buddha's usually one bowl, one hand holding the alms bowl, the other in the earth touching position. And um, so his, uh, his two arms symbolize love and compassion. He has a slight smile on his face, uh, indicating bliss, contentment, and the fulfillment that he experiences as a fully awakened Buddha. And like uh, the setting sun, his warmth pacifies the fear and rigidity of everyone who turns their mind to think of him. So when your mind gets afraid, when your mind gets rid rigid, think of Amitabha. Um, his expression also indicates acceptance and protection, belonging, compassion. So really uh, greeting us with total exception and compassion and including us in the feel of, of his compassion. So nobody is excluded from that. We don't need to prove ourselves and be better than somebody else in order to be included in Amitabha's sphere of compassion. <clears throat> um, behind him is a wish-fulfilling tree, and so he's seated in the Vajra position, okay, and uh, embodies uh, stillness and peace. So uh, on his right side, so it would be the, the left as we look at him, is uh, Chen Resi. In the Chinese, it would be Kuan Yin. Uh, the, in Tibetan, the Chen Resi, who's white and uh, standing on a moon disk and lotus with uh, four arms to, you know, prayer position and then one holding the mala and the other holding the lotus, okay? Then um, on his other side, so uh, Amitabha's left, the right as we look. <clears throat> In the Chinese, I have the, it's spelled out. Let's see if I can say it. Mahashtamaprapta, which means the arrival of great, great strength which was in Tibetan, Tukchen Tolp. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, in Chinese, in China, uh, Maha Mahashtabma was usually female. In Tibet, she became Vajrapani, who embodied, who is the embodiment of the power or strength of the Buddha. So you can see how the name switched, you know, to Vajrapani. Um, and Vajra, and in, what's interesting is that in Chinese Buddhists, apparently 
Vajrapani is one of the incarnations of Maha Stama Prapta. Okay, but he's usually blue, standing blue, I think, uh, one face, two arms. Maybe holding a lotus, I can't remember. Um, okay, so after, so when you do the refuge, you imagine, like, like you always do when you take refuge, mother on your left, father on your right, surrounded by all the sentient beings and the, uh, all the people that you don't like in front of you. You have to look at them and make peace with them before you take refuge. And then I described refuge, the whole process of taking refuge. I summarized it in the first BBC. <clears throat> then, so after you take refuge, and then after you do the four measurables, which I talked about before, yeah, then you imagine the whole um, uh, thing, you know, the whole scene absorbing into Amitabha, yeah, and then Amitabha coming to the top of your head, he dissolves into a ball of, um, of ruby red light, and then that uh, sinks into you and comes to rest at your heart and really fills your heart center. Whenever I, we talk about the heart in Buddhism, it doesn't mean your thump, thump, thump heart, which is on this side. It means your heart chakra, which is in the center of your chest. And, and so when Amitabha enters and comes to rest at your heart, then you really meditate very strongly on... Um, on f feeling Amitabha's presence, feeling his love and acceptance and compassion, and, uh, you know, feeling like your mind becomes the same nature as his. And then also letting yourself be really filled with bliss uh, when Amitabha dissolves into you and you, uh, you know, feel that kind of closeness. And from there, you can also go to meditate on emptiness, thinking that Amitabha's mind is empty and so is yours. But that uh, is something that you'll probably do more at the end of the practice, after the mantra recitation. Okay. Uh, okay. And then, after that, so you meditate strongly there, and you really feel... Um, that closeness with Amitabha, yeah. Then to start the actual practice, you again visualize Amitabha, this time on your crown, okay? So the sadhana that we're doing says, visualize the following with single-pointed clarity. So above my crown, yeah, there's an open lotus, a moon, and a sun. Hmm. So somehow he got a sun disk in this visualization. Okay, this, this sadhana was written by Lama Yeshe. Um, and then uh, Guru Amitabha is sitting on top of, of your head. And, uh, you know, the description of the body is the same as before. His holy body is radiant, and uh, so it's made of light. Don't visualize Amitabha as a statue or a painting or something solid. When, I mean, the scene in front of you when you take refuge and also now over your head. Um, so he has one face, two arms, resting in the gesture of meditation, holding an alms bowl filled with the elixir of immortality. He wears the saffron robes of ethical purity. Yeah, so Amitabha, both, both in the front, visualization for refuge, and now the visualization for the actual practice, he's wearing um, monastic robes. So that's seeing Amitabha is in the Nirmanakaya form, and Amitayas is in the uh, Sambhokakaya form, okay? And Amitayas usually isn't wearing uh, the monastic robes. <clears throat> so Amitabha's uh, crown, yeah, it is marked by a shining white ohm, his throat a radiant red ah, and his heart with a uh, shining blue whom. Now, it doesn't, um, in this one, it doesn't say anything about the Hri at his heart. 
But I think there's got to be a Hri at his heart. Okay, because the Hri is Amitabha, Buddha's seed syllable. So, I found some drawings of Hri, and I think I solved at least the puzzle I had about Amitabha's mantra. Anyway, here in uh, here is what the Hri looks like in Sanskrit. Okay. And here's the mantra written in Sanskrit, okay? Then the last, so here's the mantra uh, written in Tibetan, okay? The last syllable is the hri, so you can see what the hri looks like. It's fairly, a uh, fairly complex. It's, there's a ha, another a, uh, Kigu, and then the two dots, okay? You can also visualize H-R-I-H. Okay, so just if you, you want to. Uh, and then uh, I found it also, also in Lansa and Dev, uh, Devanagari script. Okay. Now, I don't know about you, but I always wondered why the mantra was Om Ami Deva Devua Hri. Yeah, it seemed funny to me. Well, that's the mantra that's in most of the sadhanas. And uh, Pari Rinpoche, when he gave it, gave Om Ami Tabha Hri Soha. Okay. So I'm like, hmm, why is this a show? What this person thinks, and I agree, is, you know, when the Tibetans look at Sanskrit, they often don't pronounce it uh, correctly in the same way that we don't pronounce Tibetan correctly and we don't pronounce French correctly and so on. So uh, this person, and I agree with this, hypothesizes that the mantra is, is actually in, in the Sanskrit here is Om Amitabha Hri. Om Amitabha Hri. The transliteration from the Tibetan is Om Ami Deva Hri. So that the Tibetan in pronouncing Amitabha got the changed the Taba into Deva. Yeah. In the same way that Vajra became Benza. How you got Benza from Vajra, I don't know. Okay, but it would make sense that from Taba you got Deva. Okay, now somebody, um, so if, if you used it like that, then it seems like the meaning would be Amideva root three would be Undying God. But that's what his name would mean, okay? Um, but his, you know, his name is actually in infinite light. Yeah? So, and this person is always saying, is also saying, I have also seen uh, Tibetan explanations that say that Deva, Dewa, is how the Tibetans pronounce Deva which would be translated as God, but Dewa is short for uh, Dewa Chen, the name of Sukhavati in Tibetan. If that were the case, then the mantra would be half in Sanskrit and half in Tibetan, and that doesn't make sense. The mantras are always Sanskrit. So it makes much more sense that it's Om Amitabha Hri, and it's just when the Tibetans were pronouncing it, it got changed into Om Ami Dev Dewa Hri. Okay? So I think we can say Om Ami Tabha Hri. Yeah. Pari Mimbuchi had the Soha at the end. I don't know. Uh, I don't, there's probably no fault in saying it. It's the end of a lot of uh, mantras in in Sanskrit. Okay, so that's a little bit about
parenthesis each syllable. Yeah. So then, from the hum at so amitabhas on your heart on top of your head. So from the hung at his heart, and the hung, you can put in in the the three. There's the gigu at the top. You can put the a tiny hum inside of that, or you can also make the tum the hum bigger and put the three in the circle at the top in the top of the hung, or you can just visualize hum and with a, a small three on top, or three with a small hum on top. Okay. I don't think the letters are going to fight it out to see uh, who's who's going to be the the center one. Okay, so uh, from from the free from the home, boundless light shines forth, filling all of space. This light especially penetrates Amitabha's pure land, invoking Amitabha Buddha, the great lion-like bodhisattva. So there's uh, eight great bodhisattvas. Um, which I'm going to uh, read the Amitabha Sutra. Later on, it has the names. I mean, there's Maitreya and, anyway, a lot of bodhisattvas, the eight great ones. Yeah, it's usually Manjushri, Maitreya, Chenrezig, probably Vajrapani, Samantabhadra, and a few more. Okay. So um, it penetrates Amitabha's pure land, invoking Amitabha Buddha, the great lion-like bodhisattvas, as well as the vast assembly of male and female bodhisattvas who reside in the land of great bliss. So these all come back and absorb into, enter Guru Amitabha's crown chakra, descend through his central channel, and absorb into his heart. And they are unified and of one nature. Yeah, so we, invo we imagine invoking all Amitabha the, and everybody in his pure land, all those holy beings, and dissolving them into the Amitabha on top of our head that we visualized. And this functions to help us overcome the doubt that uh, this is just an Amitabha that I've made up. But, you know, we think, oh, no, we're, you know, we're, in, we're invoking all of the realizations of all the Buddhas in the form of Amitabha and all the Bodhisattvas, and they're absorbing into Amitabha. So it's not just um, something I visualize, you know, it's really Amitabha. So that helps our own mind. And then uh, it says, hold this thought with single-pointed concentration. Okay, so that's the visualization. Then we start the the part about uh, creating merit and purifying. And so first we do the seven limb prayer, which I already described too. Okay, so now you have to fit together the visualization, which was up with, with what was already described. Hopefully you can do it. Okay. Uh, and then we go from there to mandala offering, prostrations, and so on. But we'll do that tomorrow. Okay? Mm. Someday, sometimes they say four fingers width. But I think what's ever comfortable, not too high, you know, because you want to be able to imagine nectar flowing down fairly easily and, you know, so just a, a little bit above your head. Yeah. And as far as how big Amitabha is, some people say visualize small, it helps your concentration. Other people say visualize them a cubit. I usually wind up usually about this big. So I think it depends on, you know, your own mind, what feels comfortable for you.